Supreme Court term, maybe more specifically King versus Burwell. Um, what did you think? Just talk about your thoughts on the judiciary and where it's going. Yeah, I, uh, I was on Rachel Maddow's show the other day. Oh, <laughs> man. And by the way, I had a, I, I had a, a great experience here. I, I, uh, I think she's reached out to try to have us back on again, and I'm, I'm certainly open to doing that. I'm the only Republican that's gone on her show, the Republican presidential candidate. Uh, but I think if you look, if you're going to run for president, you need to go into forums that are not friendly. You need to go into places, and I'm doing Bill Maher's show at the end of the month. So if you want to tune in, August 28th, I'll be on uh, on, on the Bill Maher show. So. Uh, the, to answer your question on that, we had a discussion about that. And here's what I would say, that how many people believe that the Constitution says that the Supreme Court has the right to determine what is constitutional? It's decided by case That's right. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives the Supreme Court the right or, or the duty or the obligation to determine what is constitutional and what is not. Marbury versus Madison. It was a Supreme Court case where they granted themselves that authority. And for a couple hundred years, roughly, we have, we have seen uh, that deference given to the court. I think, I think the court is the right place to, to make these types of constitutional judgments. But what happens if the court makes an unconstitutional judgment? What happens if the court itself violates the Constitution? Is there a remedy? So what happens if you have a rogue court, like, say, for example, in the Dred Scott case, that, takes up to, that makes a decision that is clearly outside the bounds of what the Constitution contemplates? Is there a remedy? Or do we have to just say, Supreme Court, they get the final say, and... The American public, the president, the Congress, we just have to live according to the laws as the Supreme Court says. I would make the argument that when the court exceeds its authority and acts in an unconstitutional way, it is incumbent upon the other branches of government, the concept of, you may have, you may have heard this hopefully in your civics classes, checks and balances. Anybody ever heard the term checks and balances? Check, Check. please. Yeah. <laughs> And you can pay the balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so uh, the idea that, that that the other branches of government don't have a say in constraining a branch of government that is acting unconstitutional is to, is to suggest that, that only one branch of government control the other two, and the other two have no impact on the third. That is a, that is a recipe for chaos, for, for an oligarchy, not a democracy or a republic. And so, constitutional mechanism to, to do that. There's nothing in place for that. Like, what, what do you do? Well, uh, I'll give you, yeah, I mean, obviously the most, the way that was provided to change the Constitution was by constitutional amendment. Yeah. And as you see, it's very hard to do. Because you have to pass, you have to have something passed with, uh, with two thirds of the House and Senate, and you have to get three quarters of the states to ratify. So our founders clearly wanted to be very hard to change the Constitution. That's why when you see the court change the Constitution in an unconstitutional fashion, in other words, create something that isn't in, in other words, amend the Constitution by creating something that's not there. They've short-circuited something that was supposed to be very hard to do, and there should be some remedy to say, no, you can't do that. Okay? And, and, and what is that? Well, what is that is, is the president or the Congress uh, saying you're acting unconstitutionally and we are going to, we're not going to pay attention to that law. We're not going to pay attention to your rule. We're, we're going to, uh, we're going to, uh, I'll give you a tip of what I did as a Congress. The United States Supreme Court in the Stenberg case, which was a Nebraska case, uh, found a, uh, a bill uh, that banned a procedure called partial birth abortion, unconstitutional. Uh, the dissenters in that case, it was a 5-4 decision, said that the court was way outside their bounds, that there's, no, there's nothing in the Constitution that would prohibit a state from banning a procedure that is so gruesome and barbaric to a, to a child. And, and that and that they were that they acted beyond the, the, the realm of their authority. 
So what I did when I was in the Senate is once President Bush was elected and I knew we could have a president sign the bill, we passed a, a ban on this procedure again in direct contravention to what the Supreme Court said. And we told the Supreme Court, if you read the bill, the first two sections of the bill laid out why we believe the Supreme Court was wrong in their decision. And then we passed the bill, the president signed it, and went to the court. And 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 now, the pre there had never been a federal statute on, on partial birth. Never been. It's only state statutes. So it went to the court, and in that case, the court said, okay, we'll let this one stand. So they backed out. So that's, that's the best way to have it. Now what would happen though if the court said, you're wrong and we're gonna stick by our decision? Then you have a problem. You have a constitutional crisis. Because you have two branches of government saying, we believe this is constitutional. And we have a third branch acting beyond its authority. I would make the argument that the president has the right, if he so chooses, to continue to enforce that law. Okay? And, and, and say, the court, you're wrong. Otherwise, we are being ruled by a group of judges. And I think that is, that's more dangerous, and the reason I say it's more dangerous, it's more dangerous than a president saying, no, I'm gonna enforce the law that the court says is wrong. Why? Because if the American public says, Mr. President, you're doing something we don't want you to do, you get rid of that president in four years. But you can't get rid of a court. Can you, so, right. so can you at least a Supreme Court justice? You can. Uh, you can do it, but it, it'll never happen. It, yeah, I mean, people think impeachment is a legal proceeding. It's not. It's a political proceeding. And so you have to have political support to do that, and I think that would be very hard to do. So I, I would. Here's what I would suggest: that having a president. I mean, I think the president has done things that are clearly unconstitutional. Make the president's executive order on immigration is, is blatantly unconstitutional. But we're going to have an election, and everything he did that was unconstitutional could be remedied by the next election. That is not the case with the court. It may take decades. It may, in the case of, of Dred Scott, it took a civil war uh, to, to, to be able to change it. That's why I think the court is so dangerous in exercising too much authority in these areas. Senator, can I ask something on the end of that? Chris Grubia, I know I've been joking around with you. It's been good to see you. Somewhere in there, the Emancipation Proclamation came about. Sorry? Somewhere in there, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. As president, you know, a common question, people say, what would you do day one and so forth? On day one as president, would you issue some type of proclamation about this whole Planned Parenthood scandal and, and, and that? And if you and if you are planning to do some of that, would you let us know what that would say soon? Well, I mean, Planned Parenthood is a little bit of a different thing. I mean, there's really nothing uh, that the court has dealt with as far as funding for Planned Parenthood. But I've been very clear. I mean, I would I would end funding for a group that that, that treats uh, little children in such a callous and, and barbaric manner. I mean, on that, day one? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we would we would uh, I would suspend funding for that organization. That money would go to other 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 centers that would give women women health care, uh, but it, it would not go to an organization that uh, that treats treats children in this barbaric. That's life. fantastic. Anything else on pro life? From the get go. Well, I mean, I mean it's. I didn't reinstitute the Mexico City policy, the Hyde Amendment. I mean, there's there's all sorts of things we can do immediately with respect to the use of federal funds and supporting and promoting uh, any kind of abortion. And and uh, they've been in place and would be in place. Uh, you know, the, the real the real question is, I mean, what other things you can do yeah. to? Uh, and you know, the problem with abortion and abortion law is that it's been in place for a long time. And, well, we need a leader to lead us out of that. And so you really do need a leader to lead you out of that. Uh, this other decision, the, uh, the, the same-sex marriage case, it's a different story. I mean, yeah, I'm not, that's not my nature of my question, but yeah. I appreciate you. It's similar, but I'm, I'm looking for a leader to lead this country out of the hellhole that abortion is. I think if you, if you look at anybody's question. track record on this issue, I'm probably as good as they get. Oh, I know. That's why I'm asking you. Yes, sir. Uh, if you'd like